I think if we look too much into the specifics, then you know we're missing the point here. It's are we getting enough stimulus to do one thing versus another? And I think that's that's the most important thing to consider when you're when you're doing anything. That triathlon show, two hundred and forty-four. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, it's my pleasure to welcome back Michael Rosenblatt, who was our guest last week as well. We have uh, we continue the interview. This is part two, but it's on a completely different topic, uh, because last week we talked about his uh, meta-analysis on comparing sprint interval training with high-intensity interval training. So essentially, is there such a thing as a more effective interval workout? And this week, our fo- focus turns to his other meta-analysis, which compares training intensity distributions, and specifically polarized training versus a threshold training model, which is more mid-zone heavy. So uh, we will have the link to that in the episode description and in the show notes. And uh, you will get to hear Michael discuss his findings and the meta-analysis conducted in just a little bit after we thank our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Precision Hydration make electrolyte supplements in different strengths, so different sodium concentrations which means that you can match the supplement to what the amount of sodium that you lose in your sweat because sodium concentration in sweat can vary with a significant amount between individual to individual. So somebody might be losing 500 milligrams per liter of sweat and another person might be losing 2000 milligrams per liter of sweat. And then that gets gets exacerbated if you are also talking about sweat rates being different between individuals meaning it's very important to have a specific idea of how much sodium you need to replace based on your sweat rate and your sweat sodium content. Precision hydration have have a couple of really, really fundamental guides to to determining these factors. And specifically for the sweat sodium content part, they have their online sweat test that you can take. Just answer the questions in a quiz and you will get a good estimate for how much sodium you lose in your sweat Combine that with measuring your sweat rate, as discussed in some of those fundamental articles that PH offer on their website, and you'll be off to the races and have a really, really good, specific, individualized hydration strategy that you can use in your racing and training. You can get 15% off your order with the promo code DATTRAFLONSHOW15 on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka are the world-leading manufacturers of wetsuits, trisuits, swim skins, goggles, and high-performance eyewear. And they work with uh, fantastic world-leading athletes such as uh, Lucy Charles Barclay, Javier Gomez, Mario Mola, to name just a few. So they're trusted by the best of the best in both long course and short course racing. You can get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can find on roka.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's uh, welcome back Michael Rosenblatt to the show. So welcome back, Michael, to that triathlon show. Uh, It's been a long minute or half a minute since we uh, finished our uh, conversation that uh, that the listeners heard a week ago. But let's uh, dive right into the topic of uh, of this uh, this episode, which is the other meta-analysis that you have published, which is on polarized thre- training versus threshold training. So can you first describe what that is about for the listeners that don't know, describe the, the two training models there and, and what the meta-analysis set out to, to investigate? Sure. So yeah, it's uh, great, great to be back again. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so uh, there's uh, different training models uh, that people have been talking about, I guess, for the last... 10, almost 15 years now. And that would include a a polarized uh, training model and a threshold training model. So a polarized training model uh, would consist of exercise, uh, you know, almost like what it says, polarized and opposite ends. So majority of exercise would be completed 
uh, as kind of a, like a lower or easier intensity, whereas uh, uh, maybe 15 or 20 percent or a much, uh, a much less per, uh, smaller percentage would be uh, completed uh, at a very, very high intensity with very limited to no training kind of in that moderate or middle zone there, which you know, maybe we call that race pace zones. Uh, whereas a threshold training would include a substantial amount of uh, a, a substantial greater amount of training in that kind of middle zone there. Uh, so instead of maybe, you know, 80% of the time being in the lower zone, uh, you know, maybe it's divided by 40, 40. So it's kind of equal between those two zones with just a small amount of training uh, at the very high end. Yeah, perfect. And uh, so what you did there with the meta analysis was to just uh, try to see what research has been done comparing these two models and, uh, and investigate whether one is better than the other. So can you go into that a little bit more? How did you set up the, the study inclusion criteria and what were the outcome measures and so on? Sure. So uh, I conducted a, a, a large search or systematic search with certain inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, primarily, I was looking for athletic individuals, um, uh, and that was because we wanted to see, well, if somebody's these are already trained, we want to make sure if they're going to do one versus the other, does it really matter? Uh, and uh, it was important to look at uh, uh, randomized control trials for this because uh, we wanted to, uh, or not necessarily control, but randomized uh, trials here uh, to make sure that there'd be both a polarized group and a threshold group within the same study. And that would ensure that uh, there be the, the studies would be very similar, or the, the participants would undergo very similar, uh, or, or sorry, I should say that the training included very similar participants, and uh, the studies actually ranged anywhere from uh, six weeks up to ten months. So there was there's quite a difference in in the duration of the studies, and in terms of the participants, I, as I mentioned, I wanted them to be uh, athletes. They were anywhere from recreational to competitive endurance athletes. And they had a VO2 max uh, uh, ranging anywhere from 63 to 70 mils per kg. So these were fairly fit uh, individuals, and it included uh, runners and cyclists and triathletes. And what were the the outcome measures that you that you were investigating the effects for? Yeah, uh, and so uh, I, I wanted to look at all outcome measures that would be commonly used uh, to measure endurance sport performance. So at the time, the main thing that I was thinking of was VO2 max, uh, and that would be more of an internal measure of, of performance, like a physiological measure, but also looking at external measures like time trial performance, uh, time to exhaustion, uh, as well as uh, exercise economy or, or changes in submaximal efforts. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, so what did you find? How many studies could be included? What sort of studies were they with how many participants and, and, and so on? Can you go into that? Sure. So there, there actually weren't many studies uh, that met the inclusion criteria. And, and even saying that the inclusion criteria and search criteria was, was somewhat broad. Uh, it's just that this topic isn't, you know, as much as we in endurance sport uh, find this very interesting, it's, there's just not as much literature that's done uh, in athletes on this, possibly because you know, it's hard for, for us to say, well, let's change someone's training program. They might be worried that it'll affect their performance, especially if they're trying to compete. So there was only actually four studies that met the inclusion criteria and only three that I was able to include in the meta-analysis. And so that led to approximately, I think, about 60, 64 people met uh, the inclusion criteria for the meta-analysis. Yeah, and uh, and the meta analysis was where you where you looked at those outcome measures and and pulled the data for them, and then the fourth study was still included in the systematic review. So so it's mentioned through the uh, the discussion primarily, and uh, and so you can still get some takeaways from it, but it can't be statistically used to to pull the data. Just to to clarify that, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, so so let's get into what what you found and what were the effects if there were any. So uh, the only actual meta-analysis, so again, looking at an objective number here uh, that I was able to, to do in terms of pooling information was looking at uh, the time trial performance, uh, which is great because I, I think that that's, if any measure that a coach uh, really cares about is, well, is race performance going to get better? And, and, and I think time trials might be uh, at least 
uh, in a lab or, or through research might be one of the best ways that we have, if not the best way, uh, to assess change in performance. <clears throat> and uh, we found that a polarized uh, training model led to uh, a substantially or significantly greater improvement uh, in time trial performance as compared to a threshold model. And what I did here was I looked at an effect size and we found that uh, there was a moderate effect of, uh, let's say it's almost 0.7 or, or 0.66. So it, it's quite a large, well, I don't want to say large because that would be how we would, a uh, subjective way of saying this, but uh, uh, there, was, there was a significant effect in favor of polarized training. Yeah, from from what I've seen in in the endurance sports space, because studies are small and the variance is typically high, it's very rare that you see anything larger than a moderate effect size. So, so relative for the for the field, it is uh, it is quite a strong result, even if you mm-hmm. can say it's a large effect size. Yeah, and uh, that was something that uh, I struggled with a little bit because when we, we look at the, the the not only the sample size but the number of studies included, that only three of the four studies were able to be included into the 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 pooled results, and uh, so we say, well, is this you know is this really substantial because there's only three studies? Uh, and I'd argue that yes, it, it should still be considered an important takeaway here, and and that's because well, first of all. Uh, it's unlikely there's going to be more studies that just keep pumping out the same uh, interventions like this. Like once we have a general idea that something goes in the right direction, it's time to start studying something else. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that if we look at the, the population that was included, because, and as you just mentioned, because it, these guys were between 63 and 67 mils, uh, they're very, very fit. And it'd be very hard to find more studies on really fit individuals and, and to even see a change in fit individuals that's this substantial. So yeah, small sample sizes and uh, uh, relatively speaking and, and only three studies, but I, I think that it, we can still uh, uh, get a, a relatively decent conclusion from this. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what was the sort of magnitude uh, individually per group? So how much did uh, polarized training improve time trial performance as a percentage number and uh, the same thing for threshold training? Do you have those numbers in front of you or do you remember? Um, so the magnitude, uh, at least with respect to the, the effect size, um, was quite substantial. But if we, if we actually look at, um, you know, in terms of minutes, so if we, you know, a couple of the studies use 10K uh, running time and the other one looked at a 40 kilometer cycling time trial. And interestingly, we saw the greatest improvement following the, the 10K running as compared to the 40K cycle. So there was... Uh, if we think these these athletes are running around 37, 37 and a half minutes uh, per 10K, which is, you know, they, they're not, you know, world class, they're not down to around 30 minutes or even faster. But they, I'd, I'd argue that that's still fairly quick. Uh, but they they showed anywhere from a two to a two and a half minute improvement uh, in in 10 kilometer performance. So these 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 athletes went from you know, 37 and a half, 38 minutes down to 35, 36 minutes. And, and, and that's a substantial improvement. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and that was the polarized group. But uh, do you remember the threshold group or was that uh, the difference between the two groups? So that was actually, uh, sorry, I was actually kind of looking at a little bit uh, of that. That was for the difference. Well, actually, sorry, when we look at the difference, there's, there's probably... Uh, maybe about 40 seconds difference when we look Mm. at the difference. So overall we see there's an improvement Uh, and uh, to see a 40 second improvement from one mode, from one mode to another, uh, especially at that level, you know, again, you know, let's say these are recreationally competitive uh, athletes. Uh, 40 seconds is, is quite substantial over a 10 kilometer run. Uh, and they would definitely say to me, like, "Hey, I'd rather do polarized training if I know I, if I know I can be close to a minute faster." Absolutely, yeah. I just think it's important to clarify that when we say that one model was had a moderate effect size and was shown to be better than the other, it doesn't mean that the other model doesn't work. It just means that one model works better than the other. So, so we have to be be clear about that, and uh, and that that also explains a lot of the things that you see that well. You, when you discuss with your training buddies and people say well i did this and that worked really great i improved by a lot and and that can be the case for many but uh and of course it's not to say that for every single person that 
polarized training might work better than threshold training but just that uh, we do seem to have found a trend here that that for most athletes it is better even though both can work that that would be sort of my takeaway yeah definitely and i it's funny i was just uh, i i was just talking to my students about this i i'm, I'm faculty at uh, uh at a university out here in, in british columbia and uh, it's, it's interesting. And I just gave them this exam and looking at the difference between, uh, considering a within group change versus a between group change. It's one thing to say, well, is somebody going to show an improvement? And we can see yeah, there's a greater improvement following an intervention. But what really matters is the difference between one intervention versus another. And, uh, if there's no significant difference between groups, even if one group shows an, a pre-post improvement and the other one doesn't, then it doesn't matter that that one group shows a significant improvement. What really matters is, is there a difference between the groups at the end of the training? Yeah, exactly. So uh, why then do you think that, uh, I mean, and this will be more speculation because it's not what the meta-analysis was about, but going into into sort of the, the discussion around uh, the results that you had, why do you think that polarized training might work better than threshold training? But certainly a great question. And I think it has a little bit to do more with substrate utilization. And one of the studies in, in, um, uh, that was included in the meta-analysis here looked at one marker of, of looking at substrate utilization to specifically uh, a, a fat transporter to get fat into the cell uh, so that it can be oxidized in the mitochondria. And uh, they didn't find that there was a difference in that transporter. But, you know, I'd argue, well, it depends on where you're measuring it because, you know, we can say, is this transporter, are we looking at getting it into the cell or are we getting it into the mitochondria? And then there's also different transporters uh, as well as different enzymes to actually metabolize those substrates. So uh, really what I think it has to do with is the specificity of improving an individual's ability to oxidize uh, fatty acids. And probably by doing this, it'll, it'll allow someone to not only spare muscle glycogen stores, but it'll allow them to train at a, a much higher or train as well as race, uh, at a much higher relative, uh, uh, power output, uh, because they, maybe they can use fats, uh, at higher and in relative intensities. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And then, um, yeah, that, that would also lead to, yeah, basically your, your threshold increases, right? right? Or your lactate steady state increases. So you can stay on in that uh, heavy domain compared to the severe domain uh, yeah. for longer. Um, and the one thing that I've uh, been like struggling with or trying to figure out with polarized training is what really is the the secret of it because what you say there makes a lot of sense especially when we consider that the a very important part of the stimulus there to improve fat oxidation would be the large amount of training done in uh, in the low intensity uh, training zone in a three zone model so so do you think that that is sort of the secret source of polarized training and is the polarized uh, approach of actually having more zone three compared to zone two in the three zone model again so actually having that that high-end training rather than the moderate intensity training. Which of those do you think is more important, if any, or do you have any thoughts around, around that? So, yeah, I, I certainly do. And, and actually, one other thing that I, I forgot to mention in our, our last, in the last comment there was, in addition to, to just the, you know, what are we doing physiologically or metabolically to the system, we also need to think about any type of training st uh, stimulus and the type of fatigue that it can generate. So, as you go to a higher intensity, so let's say we go from the moderate intensity domain, which that can sound kind of tricky because the moderate domain is where you would actually do the low intensity. It's just the way that they name it. Uh, and into that heavy domain, which is that threshold domain, uh, uh, we know that uh, it'll cause a greater amount of fatigue for athletes. And so if you're training a lot in this 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 middle zone there, or that let's say that threshold or that kind of zone where you would be racing – you're more likely to, to generate um, uh, fatigue and it might take longer to recover. And so if you think about, you know, you go for a race pace effort run, uh, that's, that would be likely be in that domain, depending on the length, uh, duration of time that you're running, you're tired. And, you, you know, you'll need a couple of days to recover from that. 
So that could potentially be one of the other reasons. But when, when we think about, you know, the, the secret sauce of, you know, is it, is it one versus, uh, versus another, uh, you know, how much time is really needed to spend in, in one zone versus another, uh, the, there's a lot to think about. And I, it's funny, I, I always call it the it depends factor. <laughs> Uh, and nothing's ever absolute. Uh, so first of all, I th- I'd say it depends on where you are in your training cycle. You know, if you're way out of race, uh, uh, you know, you're not close to your racing season, you say, well, what are the goals that you want to do? And so you say, well, is it important to put this emphasis in to improve my efficiency versus my race pace specific type, the, the specificity for race pacing? Uh, and then... We say, well, what are we actually trying to do here? And, you know, if we want to race faster, we'd say, well, we need to be able to hold, let's say, our second ventilatory threshold or our critical power, you know, be at that threshold for as long as we possibly can. So that would be, you know, if we can hold that point indefinitely and we can hold it for a very, very high power output or speed, then that would be beneficial. And, And so if we call that your second ventilatory threshold, there's a correlation between your second ventilatory threshold and your first ventilatory threshold. And that first ventilatory threshold would be, you know, where when you look at fat max studies and where people actually have the greatest ability to oxidize the greatest amount of fats, it's right at their first ventilatory threshold. And so I I think I use this analogy of, you know, a house and you have the first floor, the second floor, and then the ceiling. And there's two ways that you can improve your, your fitness. You, you want to improve your, uh, your VO2 max, which would be the ceiling or the roof. And you want to push that as high as possible. But then the, the first floor and the second floor would kind of go with it. Uh, but in order to push the second floor, you have to push the first floor. And in order to push the first floor, you have to be able to oxidize a greater amount of fatty acids. And then if we look at, you know, the exact specifics of, you know, the numbers of, well, you know, should it be, you know, 80% in one zone versus 75? I, I think that's kind of where we're going here a little bit. Uh, I think, I think if we look too much into the specifics, then, you know, we're missing the point here. It's, are we getting enough stimulus to do one thing versus another? And I think that's, that's the most important thing to consider when you're, when you're doing anything, you know, it, it's, it's the same thing when you're doing interval training, which, you know, in, when we're looking at high intensity interval training and you're, you're in the severe intensity domain and you're doing these long bouts, it doesn't matter if you're exercising at 85% or 80%. What matters is, are you kind of in this zone and doing generally what you need to be doing? Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and yeah, you're, you're exactly right. That's sort of where I wanted to go. And, uh, and it makes sense actually when we look at one of the studies that was included, which is I think the biggest uh, control trial that has been done on polarized training, which is the one by uh, Stögel and Spirlich, Mm -hmm. they actually in the polarized group, they only did 68% of uh, training in their zone one in the low intensity, uh, low intensity zone. So that just goes to show that it was still polarized, but, but it's not the same as having to be 80% exactly. That's, that's not the point. Right. And, and that, if I remember correctly, yeah, that was a little bit of a longer study uh, in terms of the duration. The, oh, no, that was the Steve Lano, different one. But uh, uh, yeah, and, and it's important to consider you know, what the phase is. So you can't say, like, are you going to be completely doing a polarized model? So in fact, uh, as, a, as a coach, what, what I would do uh, typically is I would I primarily have someone do a polarized model until we get a little bit closer to race pace efforts. Uh, and... W- it's interesting because when you look at just threshold training alone, we don't see the same amount of improvements in VO2 max as we would in, in doing a polarized uh, uh, training intensity distribution. But something that's important to consider is the rate of substrate utilization, right? And so, and then also the psychology of exercising at, it, at your race pace efforts or in that, that threshold zone. And so I, I'd argue that while you may not see the same types of improvements uh, it's maybe physiological improvements or, or, or racing performance. There's other benefits that a coach and an athlete needs to consider. Actually, if anything, I'd say that a physiologist needs to consider because they're only looking at the physiology where the coach and the athletes thinking about all these other things too. 
Uh, I can say that because I'm a physiologist, so I, <laughs> I can say that sometimes we forget what's important. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's important to think, well, you know, are you able to do these other things that are important in your racing? And, and if you're going to utilize substrate at a certain rate, maybe you have to know how to refuel depending on the length of the race. So you, you do need to train uh, in these other uh, in these other zones or, or domains uh, based on what your goal is. Yeah, yeah, and and to give some examples from from my coaching, when you mentioned there that depending on where you are in your training cycle, when when I'm working with athletes and they're working on high intensity, the distribution might look something like eighty five five ten in the low moderate and and high intensity zones, but when we're working on more on the race specific training, or perhaps we're working on something like um, like just strength endurance VLA max type of training. Uh, then it might look like 70, 25, 5 or, or something to, to that effect. So then basically what, what I'm getting at is that the the amount of training you you can spend above zone one, I think seems to increase when we are doing more moderate training versus really high intensity training, which obviously makes makes total sense. It's not rocket science, but uh, but I've actually made those calculations with with athletes and tracked that and and seen that to seem to be the case. Yeah, and I actually uh, the the I guess the models that you just described is somewhat similar to what what I've done in the past is where I, I kind of see more of that. Let's say I, I I might even go absolutely into the eighty twenty uh, for the first little bit, but then what would end up happening maybe six or eight weeks out of a race, maybe a little longer, uh, again depending on the individual in, in the race. Uh, I might do something that that's closer to like a sixty or seventy twenty five, and then a five. Uh, because I yeah. want them to start. So yeah, very similar uh, idea to what I do as well. Yeah. One thing that I'd be remiss not to ask is, uh, does this does polarized training break down at a certain amount of training hours per week? Uh, that's something we didn't discuss yet. Well, how much did these athletes train? They were well-trained, obviously, so uh, probably a fair bit, but these can be just your your own thoughts, not necessarily from the from your meta-analysis. What, what do you think? At, at what point... Does it or does it not work? So that that's actually a very important question. And uh, so these guys definitely kept more of that, you know, that polarized model because they were training a lot and it made sense. Uh, if you're, you know, if you think like, are you a beginner athlete, uh, you know, novice and you haven't done anything versus are, are you know, you're recreationally active and then, you know, there's a scale kind of even in there. Um, I'd say it really depends because, you know, if you're, if you're a novice athlete, it, 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 and it's hard to say that it doesn't matter because to a certain degree it does. You want to opt, you know, if we have limited time that we can training, that we can train, especially for novice, it's probably because we also work. Uh, and another thing that we would need to consider that, you know, you might not need to, to demonstrate such a, a, a polarized model because, well, even just training three times a week or even twice a week is better than nothing. And so you're going to see improvements. So then you'd say, well, if I'm going to do this, well, what should I be doing in those two or three days a week? And then as you're able to, you have more time to exercise, uh, that's when maybe you'd say, is this going to start shifting more towards a polarized model? So I think it's, it's based on, you know, someone's fitness level and, and, and how much time they're able to devote to their training. And, and cause you, you there, there's studies. So even within these, these, uh, studies that were included in the meta-analysis, there's one study that included just a hit group alone versus a hit and uh, 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 with continuous training to make it a polarized model. And I had this discussion with one of the faculty at, at the University of Toronto, uh, and he had mentioned that, well, I think that, you know, it's, it's really hit that is all that matters and that the rest is just junk miles. And I would disagree with him. But then uh, in the sense that, well, one, well, what's happening with these lower intensity, what's happening physiologically, but this one study here, I can't remember which one it might've been. It might've been the Stoggle study. It's either the Stoggle or the Muno study uh, where uh, they did a comparison and found that the polarized group led to a greater improvement in performance than just the hit, at least in VO2 max. We, that study wasn't able to include a time trial. So, uh, so yeah, I think that was the Stoggle study, but, uh, and those were volume matched or work matched somehow. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. 
Uh, but uh, again, if we're thinking about uh, the difference between it, it's it's interesting because we're always trying to compare as long as they're always doing the same amount of work. But if we we think of that kind of analogy of well, if we're in a different zone, uh, maybe the stimulus is a complete. It's like taking a different drug. Uh, yeah. So it might not necessarily matter. I mean, we you know I think additional studies might be beneficial to look at that as well. But it showed that the polarized model was better than doing the just the hit alone. Uh, but again, I'd argue, well, is this in, you know, is it because these guys are really fit and they're able to handle a lot more load? Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's, or do you have any final take-home messages for uh, for the listeners, for the athletes and the coaches listening to this? Like what would be the practical takeaway? So I, I think that's it's important to to talk about the take home message from this because I don't want people to be too confused with when I'm saying yes, polarized looks like the way to go, uh, even though there's a small sample size uh, and number of studies. Polarized uh, training will certainly improve performance, and I s- strongly suggest that we use that with our athletes as indicated. But then uh, to consider what point in their training uh, cycle uh, your athletes are in. Uh, if you do need to shift uh, a little bit more to a threshold model. So uh, I guess I, there's just that it depends factor. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Uh, anything else you want to mention, Michael? Anything we missed? Uh, and, or yeah, anything anything at all you want to bring up from this, this study or the other one that we talked about last week? Uh, feel free to do so. Um, I think... You know, it, it's important to consider all aspects of training. Uh, the the previous talk that we did, we looked at um, you know one component of training, which would be looking at interval interval training. But then there's also this the distribution, and I think it's important to uh, to consider you know why we're doing each thing, and and I think that's important for athletes to always be asking their coaches as well, thinking, well, you know, why are we doing you know hit versus sit, or why are we doing uh, you know, a polarized versus a threshold model and, and to always consider, uh, you know, the mechanisms as well as the performance measures with it. Uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's really it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and related to that, I, I would say that, uh, this is something I mentioned before and done an, an episode of, but, uh, Steven Seiler, who is uh, somebody who has done work, work on polarized training, uh, did a presentation that is available in ResearchGate called uh, the hierarchy of endurance training needs, and uh, that's something that I think really helps uh, helps you kind of see see the forest and not miss it for the trees. Uh, so with just the base being the volume, and then you have the uh, the intensity, and then you have the the training intensity distribution, and then then as you get to the higher levels, you start to have things like altitude training and tapering and and so on. But just looking at those base layers and what they are that, that helps you get a view on on what what are really the most important things in training and and we talked about uh, layers two and three here with uh, in these two interviews with uh, the intensity in the previous episode and then now the training intensity distribution so uh, so yeah i think that we've done a, done a good job with that mm-hmm. yeah all right uh, thank you so much michael it was a pleasure uh, talking to you and uh, best of luck in your continued research and i hope to have you on another time when you have uh, finished uh, that study you're working on the, the meta regression yeah well thank you for having me it's uh, certainly a pleasure i hope that you enjoyed that episode and as usual you can find the show notes on scientific the show notes will contain links to the specific meta-analysis discussed here, as well as some related episodes that I've done in the past on this topic, specifically on polarized training, including the interview I did with Steven Seiler in episode 177 and some follow-up Q&As after that episode. On Thursday, we will have another Q&A coming out, and then next Monday, I interview coach Erik Myr Nossum, who is the head coach of the Norwegian uh, cross-country skiing national team. So that's the first, the first cross-country skiing coach we've had on that triathlon show. And actually, I really, really enjoyed the conversation I had with Erik. So stay tuned for that. Uh, It's uh, definitely not just specific to cross-country skiing. We do talk a lot about just general endurance training advice. So, uh, and Erik has his own endurance training podcast, which is 
not specific to cross country skiing per se, but more of endurance sports as a whole. So, uh, so worth tuning in for that. If you are not already subscribed to the podcast, then uh, please subscribe so that you don't miss any of the episodes we have coming up. Now, finally, just a heads up that if you are looking for training plans or coaching services, you should go and check out scientifictriathlon.com where you can learn more about those products and services. And for even more information, just send me an email. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and take their free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy and get 15% off your order with the promo code thatstriathlonshow15. And a thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, dry suits, swimskins, goggles, and high performance eyewear, and sunglasses and prescription glasses. And get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can find on roka.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>